we'll be starting in a few seconds. Can you hear me now? My my computer froze for for a minute. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we all hear you. When I went to mute my microphone, I lost being able to see everybody. I can only see myself now. What should I do? Okay, yeah, my my window froze for a while, so I wasn't able to look at the. Okay, I'm gonna start in about ten seconds. Oh no. I, I can only see myself right now. We can see you there, Matt. Um, You probably hit the pin button, <clears throat> so you pinned yourself. So just find that little tack icon and hit that. Okay, I'm going to call this meeting to order. Good evening, welcome to the meeting, school board meeting of Independent School District 271. Today is Monday, April 6, 2020, it is 7 p.m. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the executive orders issued by Governor Tim Walz, the school board meeting will not be conducted in the Arlene Bush boardroom at the Educational Services Center. The meeting will be conducted via Google Hangouts Meet in live stream on BEC TV. We have a resolution and electronic school board meetings study sessions. Would the board member please read the resolution? Yes, Madam Chair, I'll read the resolution. Um, be it resolved due to the current federal and state emergency declarations and guidance about limiting person-to-person -person contact due to the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic and action of the School Board of Independent School District 271 Bloomington Public Schools, all future meetings, study sessions of the Bloomington School Board will be conducted in accordance with Minnesota Statute 13D.021, meetings by telephone or other electronic means until further notice. Due to the health pandemic, the School Board has determined that it is not feasible for at least one board member, the superintendent, or the district legal counsel to be physically present at a regular school board meeting location. It is also not feasible for the public to attend at the regular meeting location due to the health pandemic. In accordance with Minnesota Statute 13D.021, members of the public are not permitted to attend this meeting due to the current health pandemic. Persons may live stream meeting study sessions through BEC TV, and then there's their, their website, Public comments for school board meetings may be submitted as follows, schoolboard at isd271.org. Second, Steigoff. Thank you. Superintendent, do you have any comments regarding this resolution? I have no comments, thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to do the roll call for approval of this resolution, starting with Director Bibi. Um, aye. Director Bennett? Yes. Director Olson? Aye. Director Sorum? Aye. Director Starks? Aye. Director Steigoff? Aye. Aye, thank you. Going to the next item. Sorry, this takes a while. Um, we have approval of the agenda. Would somebody like to move approval? So moved. Second. Is there a second? Steigoff. Thank you. Uh, we're going to do roll call once again for the approval of agenda. Director Bibi. Director Bibi. Aye. Director Bennett. Yes. Director Olson. Aye. Director Sorum. 
Aye. Director Starks? Aye. Director Steiger? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Sorry, my, my windows have frozen. Okay, here we go. It's okay. Okay, the next item we have is recognition of staff. And for Madam this Chair, one, can I interrupt uh, you for a second? Madam Chair, can we do a roll call? We still haven't done the roll call yet. For attendance, you mean? Yeah, roll call. We didn't do the roll call. We skipped that part. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so let's make sure everybody is attending. So going back to the roll call, uh, Director Beth Beebe. Here. Director Tom Bennett. Present. Director Maya Olson. Here. Director Jean Sarum. Here. Director Heather Starks. Here. Director Don Steiger. Present. And Chair Nelly Corman is present. Thank you. Okay, so now we go back to Okay, now we can go into the recognition of staff. So we have introduction of our new executive director of community education. I'd like to call uh, the administrator presenting today. Thank you, Chair Corman. Good evening. It is my pleasure to introduce our new executive director of community education, Mr. Jake Winchell. Jake started with us a week ago on April 1st. Mr. Winchell comes to us from the Cannon Falls School District. For the past 11 years, he has led their community education program. What impressed the interview team about Jake is his valuing of teamwork and data and his people and leadership skills. Jake holds an undergraduate degree from Gustavus College and a graduate degree in educational leadership from Minnesota State University. We look forward to a great relationship with Jake. Jake, I invite you to address the board as you start a new chapter in your career. Thank you, Mr. Fujitaki. Good evening, board, Chairman Corman. Thank you for the opportunity tonight. I'm extremely excited to be here and to be a part of Bloomington Public Schools. Um, nearly a week into this, and I can't speak highly enough about the people and um, what, what you have going on here at Bloomington. I, it's, it's unusual circumstances, but I'm, I, I can't say enough about the great things that you have going on and the wonderful people that you have here. I'm so grateful for those that have reached out to me to help me as I transitioned into this new role. The community education staff has been great. Um, the cabinet members have been great. There have been so many people who have been willing to reach out to me and, and to help and do whatever it takes to help me, you know, get into this role and to be successful here. So really excited to be here, um, ready to grow and to, to continue to grow as a member of the Bloomington Public Schools. A little bit more about myself. Um, I'm married to my wife, Megan, of nearly 10 years now. Um, together, we have three children and a fourth on our way that, uh, later this summer. So. Uh, some great things going on in my house and i um, really excited about our future and again i'm so proud to be a part of this team and i'm really excited to to join um, this great this great public school district that we have here in bloomington and um, i can't wait to continue to grow so that's all i have thank you again and um, back to you chair Carmen. thank you we're really excited to have you be part of our team so we welcome you to the the bloomington schools family Thank you. Next in our agenda, um, approval of part A of our agenda. Will somebody move that approval, please? So moved. Is there a second? Second, Steiger. Thank you. Part A of this agenda is board business, field trace approvals, contracts, agreements, in finance. So I'm going to call on each one of the board members for approval. Director Bibi. Approve. Director Bennett. Yes. Director Olson. Yes. Director Sorum. Yes. Director Starks. Yes. Director Steiger. Yes. And yes, that part A has been approved.
I apologize. I'm having issues with my windows frozen, freezing all the time. But here we go again. Um, okay, so now we moved into part B of our agenda. The first item is the beta award re-roofing Jefferson High School and Kennedy High School. Would someone please read the resolution? Yes. Um, be it resolved, oh, yes, be it resolved, the School Board of Independent School District 271 accepts a bid of $526,809 for re-roofing at Jefferson and Kennedy High Schools from Flynn Midwest LP in Plymouth, Minnesota, and authorizes administration to enter into the contract with this vendor. Is there a second? Yes, second by Sorum. Thank you. I'd like to call Brad Sitkovich, Executive Director of Finance and Support Services. Chair Corman, Superintendent Fujitaki, board members. Um, this is a project that is part of our overall all facility plan um, that we submit to the board uh, once a year. We also have a 10-year uh, plan that uh, the board approves every year. Uh, this is part of the uh, levy in the rest of the process that the board has approved already. Um, and again, it's a roofing project for this summer uh, for the two high schools. Okay, um, do we have any comments or questions, board members? I am gonna call for once every one of you. Director Bibi? No questions. Director Bennett? Pass. Director Olson? No questions. Director Sorum? No questions. Director Starks? Pass. Director Steiger? Pass. Okay, and I don't have any questions at the moment, so we are going to go ahead and vote. And uh, for knowledge of the public, um, board members have all had the opportunity to ask questions previous to this meeting. So we're going to go vote now. That, please. Um, please, if you approve, please say aye. Director Bibi? Aye. Director Bennett? Aye. Director Olson? Aye. Director Sorum? Aye. Director Starks? Aye. Director Steiger? Aye. Aye. Okay. So this resolution has been approved. Thank you. Going to our next one, our next item is Ideal Energy's Green to Solar Agreement. Would someone like to read the resolution, please? Hi, Maya Olson will read the resolution. Go ahead, Director Olson. Be it resolved that the School Board of Independent School District 271 approves an agreement with Ideal Energy's a Green to Solar Company for the purpose of installing rooftop solar energy panels at two sites, Kennedy High School and Jefferson High School, and authorizes administration to enter into the agreement. Is there a second? Heather Stark seconds. Thank you. Once again, we have Brad Sikovic, Executive Director of Finance and Support Services, to talk to us about this resolution. Thank you, Chair Carmen. Uh, this uh, resolution is for, um, as, as stated, uh, for installing uh, solar panels on both Kennedy and Jefferson. We have done something similar to that in a smaller scale at Indian Mounds and Valley View Middle. Um, as we keep extending our uh, energy program, uh, Director Bennett also um, I asked a question today about do we have, we had solar gardens. Uh, we still have those solar gardens. Um, this is just expanding our solar uh, footprint uh, within the community and the rest of doing projects that are beneficial both to uh, the district and the environment. Thank you. Do board members have any comments or questions? Director Beebe. No, no questions. Director Bennett. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for uh, for doing this. It's a it's a great thing that we could um, you know, help the environment, reduce our carbon footprint, and save the district some money and the taxpayers some money. So 
So thanks for doing this. Director Olson. Yes, I'm excited about it too. My my son is uh, going to be doing an internship in the solar energy department. So I'm very excited about it. Director Sorum. No questions. Director Starks. Pass. Director Stega. Pass. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to vote on this resolution. Um, if you are, um, if you approve this resolution, please say aye. Director Bibi. Aye. Director Bennett. Aye. Director Olson. Aye. Director Sorum. Aye. Director Starks. Aye. Director Steiger. Aye. And Corman, aye. Next item we have is the COVID-19 updates. And for this one, I'll call Superintendent Les Fujitake for the opening remarks. Good evening. Thank you, Chair Corman. And thank you to the viewing audience for tuning in to watch this broadcast. And thank you to the school board for giving the district team an opportunity to share how the school district is responding to the governor's executive orders related to the COVID pandemic. The governor called to action all Minnesota school districts to do three things. First, implement a district learning program. Second, provide childcare to children of healthcare workers and first responders. And third, to continue to provide meals to the children of our community. There are very few moments in my professional career that make me prouder than I am tonight. I'm proud of the quiet, hardworking way our school team and community has responded to the governor's call for help and service. Tonight, we have a series of presentations to give you a feel, a glimpse of how creative, innovative, and how your schools and your school community are adapting and responding to the surreal situation. Your school team has impressively risen to the call to action because they love kids and they know how important it is to respond in these challenging times to help all our children of our community continue to learn and grow. Before passing the microphone to Rick Hoffman to MC the presentations, Rick is our community relations director and he's in charge of our emergency management program. I'll take this opportunity to say on behalf of the school team, please accept our best wishes to everyone for safety and good health. Rick, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Superintendent Fujitaki, Madam Chair, members of the school board and viewing audience joining us tonight via BEC TV. I'll echo the superintendents, thank you for the opportunity to share with you how we as a unified team of leaders, teachers and support staff are responding to the COVID-19 outbreak. To invoke the off-use phrase uncharted territory to describe these times seems pretty pale. Now that we are entering our fourth week of schools being closed and a second full week of stay at home orders. A school crisis sends a shockwave through systems and communities that over time dissipates as we rush to recover, respond and recover. It affects the school community alone as other districts offer thoughts and prayers while quietly breathing sighs of relief. For more than a month, no single school district has faced this global pandemic alone. Every school district, every community, every state is facing the same uncertainties. School districts have become a beacon of hope in these times of crisis. So as we prepared for and respond to this ever growing tidal waves crashing into our communities and our everyday personal and professional lives, we are embracing the challenges to serve, to teach, to listen and to communicate. We know many of our students, families and staff are experiencing stress and anxiety. We're reminded that it is during these times that our children look to the trusted adults in their lives for security and guidance. As the superintendent noted, we have met this challenge with our leadership team, emergency operations personnel, and employees in every sector of our district who have banded together to develop plans that are designed to minimize disruption to teaching and learning, to feed thousands of students daily, and to protect each other from the potential exposure to the virus. We are truly looking out for each other, for our students, and our families, and our community. Tonight, you will hear from district and school leaders and frontline staff 
teachers and paraprofessionals and nurses who represent all of their colleagues and their teammates with accounts of what we are doing to continue to serve our students and families. I will introduce the topic in each speaker or speakers as we go through this evening. This will allow them the time to unmute their microphones. These accounts are only snapshots of the daily work in this new normal. Given the constraints of time and technology, we can't accurately reflect all of the great work that staff are doing as part of our amazing response. With that, let me introduce tonight Health Services Director Hannah Hatch and Jennifer Hayes, a registered nurse at Popper Bridge Elementary School, to kick off our evening of, of information sharing. Thanks, Rick. Good evening, Chair Carmen, board members, and Superintendent Fujitaki. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share tonight. Uh, this evening, I'll be sharing with you just a brief update as to what Health Services has been doing during this time of social distancing and stay-at-home orders. Uh, first and foremost, as many of you know, the information around COVID-19 has continually been changing. It updates and changes uh, daily, if not hourly. So a big part of health services has been consulting with different agencies and keeping up to date on all the information. We've been in contact with the Minnesota Department of Health and Bloomington Public Health on a daily basis, receiving updates and recommendations from them, along with consulting with them around questions that have come up within our district. We also have received uh, regular updates from the CDC and continue to uh, monitor the situation that's going on specifically in Minnesota, but also in our country. Along with those updates and recommendations, uh, we have provided a lot of guidance around social distancing, how to maintain that, and proper protective equipment for our staff and volunteers at the different settings. Uh, we have implemented screenings throughout anyone who, or throughout the district where anyone is uh, opting in to work. So at our food distribution site and at our child care site, we are providing screenings for staff and students that come and the screening guidelines that have been recommended through the Department of Health. Uh, we've been consulting with teachers around distance learning to help support families as they are at home right now. And nurses have been volunteering daily at the child care sites. Uh, we've been any nurses who are not assigned to care for students at the child care sites have been working to create a list of any high risk, high risk students or families with high medical needs that they can reach out to and support during this difficult time. Uh, as Rick mentioned, I brought Jennifer along with me. She's the registered nurse at Poplar Bridge Elementary and has had the opportunity of working at the child care center and consulting with our other nurses there. And she'll provide you with an update as to what it is like working at the child care on a daily basis. Thank you, Hannah. And thank you everybody for allowing us to give you this update as to what we have been doing at the child care site. Um, one of the big things we've been doing is answering lots and lots of questions. As Hannah said, it is changing by the minute, not just by the day, the information. And so we are very much involved with keeping up to date on what the information is out there and sharing that with staff and um, making sure that they are aware of what these changes are. The other thing that we have done at the daycare is we have helped set up the social distancing guidelines there um, to make sure that there is the correct ratio of everything for um, students in a classroom with staff so that we're not um, going above and beyond what the governor has suggested. Um, we have been assisting with um, screening the staff and students that come into the building so that none of them are coming in with fevers or any symptoms that would make them not eligible to be there for that day. And we have been um, assisting with helping get set up with all the extra precautions that have been um, thankfully given to the staff that are working there for um, to protect themselves and the other students and staff that are there. So we appreciate being able to have that. So 
that's been about it. It's gone very, very well. I have touched base with every nurse that has worked throughout the time and everyone has had positive feedback from um, them with how well it has gone. Great, thank you, Jennifer. As Jennifer said, we've had a pretty smooth transition to staffing the childcare. Fortunately, at this time, it hasn't been overrun with ill visits, but we've prepared a protocol for any students or staff that do come in presenting sim sim with symptoms of COVID-19 and what our protocol is around that, aligning with the recommendations with the, of the Department of Health. Uh, lastly, I just want to thank all of the nurses here at Bloomington Public Schools. They have jumped in and had, have been willing to do whatever it takes to help support our students and families during this time. Several of them have volunteered to uh, put themselves in high-risk situations or do whatever it takes to uh, be there to support any families that need it. And they've also gone above and beyond to provide resources for our families and work extremely hard with the information that has been changing frequently. I also wanted to thank our staff with their patients uh, as this information changes so frequently that we often are providing updates and then changing it later in the day and re-updating them and they've been so patient and understanding and flexible and going along with the new recommendations that come out each day. Thank you. Thank you Hannah and uh, Jennifer. Next up will be an update on our distance learning plan Andy Kubis is the Executive Director of, of Learning and Teaching. Andy? Thanks, Rick. Chair Corman, Superintendent Fujichaki, school board members and viewing public. I too am honored to be here to present for you and give you a high level update what's been happening with distance learning. Uh, I'll echo what the superintendent said. Uh, there's been two or three times in this time period where have uh, it's been the most proud I've been as a member of the Bloomington Public Schools team. I've been here for over 20 years. And there's been two or three times that uh, I know my heart grew three sizes bigger uh, just from the work that's that's happening. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't start out by thanking our teaching staff. What an incredible job they have done rallying to provide what's best for kids and families. Uh, no one no one chose this. Uh, this had been decided for us based on the events of the world. And uh, again, a proud moment for me uh, when. Teachers, is, I mean, we had a spring break and I know that we had teachers just working and working and working to be ready for kids on that Monday. We're, we're lucky to have the teaching staff and the staff that, the support staff that we have here in Bloomington. That, that has to be first and foremost. Um, when the governor's executive order came out on March 15th, uh, we were ready in Bloomington and I'm proud to say that as well. We saw it coming. Uh, from a leadership standpoint, we began to plan about what might happen if this happens and so, uh, we were ready with activities and a skeleton of a plan of, of what distance learning might look like. And then what I thought was um, really, really important was that we had the time then to be able to make a stronger plan. And so during that time, uh, some incredible things happened. Uh, just to highlight a couple uh, with our partnership with technology, uh, we hosted some Google Hangout sessions for all of the elementary teachers by grade level. And so again, <clears throat> another moment for me of, of being proud was to, to jump into those Google Hangout sessions and watch the way that teachers were helping each other, the way that they were giving each other advice, listening to different ideas to put together the best plan for kids. It was really heartwarming to watch that happen over and over and over again in that day. Uh, since then, we've done the same thing with our secondary colleagues, where we've hosted Google Hangout sessions, uh, both technology and uh, John's going to talk about that later, I'm assuming. Uh, and again, based on their subject, but just getting together and being great colleagues to each other and making sure that this plan is 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 working. So <clears throat> the other thing that I would want to talk about from a, a technology standpoint uh, is we all just partnered. I mean, special education, learning supports, EL, I mean, we all came together, was just coming up and preparing our families with not knowing what was going to be happening, but with checklists about here's what you need to do to be ready for distance learning. Here's what kids need. Here's what teachers need. Here's what, what uh, parents need. And, and just did a wonderful, a wonderful job. I say one of the, the tenets of our plan that I am really most proud of is our phase in plan. So over a four week uh, session, we phase in 
the rigor of what's happening. Just like what would happen at the beginning of a school year, uh, when kids come to school, those first couple weeks are about routines, making sure that we know what the routines are, what the rules are, what the norms are, how we're gonna act, how we're gonna treat each other. And the team that put this, that this work together considered that, that this is a new norm. And so we need to establish routines and kind of bring ourselves up to speed and bring our kids and families up to speed. Uh, that's been a really, really good thing for, for us as we move forward and in, in phase in the rigor, as I mentioned. So really, really good. <clears throat> Having said that, I think it's really important that we all understand and our, and our public understands that this, this isn't school as we know it. Uh, we know that school is connections and trusted adults and going somewhere safe and eating with friends and talking with teachers. School is about support systems and psychologists and social workers and counselors there to help you every day that you can just walk and get some help. That's what school is, not, not just the, the curriculum instruction. And this is, this is not school. This isn't homeschool either. Homeschool is something that people choose and nobody chose this, as I said before. And so this is emergency school. And in emergency school, uh, we, a team has done a great job of coming up with what might emergency, emergency school look like, uh, knowing that we're doing our best to replicate all the different things that happen in the brick and mortar school. That's going to take time and it's going to take us understanding that we've got a whole bunch of people that we're catering to. We've got some families who are saying this is too much. We've got some families who are saying this is just right. And we've got some families who are saying we need more. And so in an emergency school setting, we're taking all of those things into account. And so we've got some really good feedback loops. We're hearing from families. I know our teachers are hearing from families and our principals and site leaders are hearing from families about their experience. We've also enlisted some feedback loops in our, prop, our school proper, in our, in our uh, as I said, site teams, but our um, distance learning team. We have a problem solving team that gets together and talks about what's, what's percolating to the top. What are some of the things that we've missed or some things that we need to tweak? So we're iterating the, iterating the plan all of the time to make sure we're meeting the needs of families. We've got our district instruction team full of teachers who are bringing feedback. We've got our district's learning supports team doing the same thing. And then partnering with the uh, Office of, of Re uh, Research and Evaluation, as well as community relations, we've got surveys going out to families. So we're always looking for feedback to continuous improve, knowing that what we started with has to match for everyone's needs. And so again, I'm really, really proud of everybody coming together and doing this work. And it's hard. It's hard in my house. I'm a Bloomington resident with, with uh, two kids in the system. Uh, it's difficult for families to, to manage this and we have to take this into account. For one of our, one of our sons, this, uh, the work is too much. And for one of our sons, it's not enough. And so we're living that as well at our house. And so uh, be confident that you've got a great team of people who are working at that and understand uh, in, in certain terms that this is difficult and we're doing our best to meet everyone's needs. The last thing I'll say is uh, in talking with colleagues across the state, we're not alone in trying to figure this out. And so we have to, we have to remember that, that this is nothing that we chose. This is a world pandemic that is causing us to change the way that we do school. This is not school as we'd like it, but boy, the people are working hard to make it such. So really proud to be part of this team and really proud of the work that's being done. Back to you, Director Corman. Thanks, Andy. Um, next up, we'll hear from John Weiser, the Executive Director of Technology and Information Services. Good evening, Chair Corman, Superintendent Fujitaki and board members. Uh, purpose of my update is to give you and our viewers a high level overview of the technology supports in place for our students and staff during this distance learning time. Uh, the guiding principle from the governor and from the Minnesota Department of Education it what is to ensure, quote, equitable education and equal access to learning and instruction, end quote. So thanks to our community and board leadership, the passing of the 2013 tech referendum has put us in a, in a good position, I think, to adjust to an extended period of distance learning. We have our challenges for sure, uh, but without that referendum funding, they would be so much greater. Uh, I know that from listening to some of the conversations of my colleagues in, in other districts. 
Uh, I have four updates for you. Number one, student devices. We are a one-to-one -one district at grades three through 12. So students have been used to carrying Chromebooks home daily for quite a while. For our younger grades, as Andy said, we had a little bit of time to prepare for distance learning. Our school staff uh, stepped up and were able to ensure that every student is also able to access, has access to a device to continue to do school from home. Number two, internet access. We have, as an ongoing commitment from 2013, uh, an assurance that internet access is provided for students when they're away from school. Under normal conditions, this is about a two and a half to 3% internet gap. We meet that need with a system of checking out Wi-Fi hotspots for students, and we have about 220 uh, pucks in circulation from our sites. In preparation for distance learning, we ordered and prepared an additional 75 hotspots, and we've been distributing those as they've been uh, as the needs have arose. Number three, tech repair. Technology does break down occasionally. Uh, we have created a phone number for parents, an email address, and a text address for students and families to contact my team directly for support. We've answered about 200 help tickets a day so far. To give you some uh, sense of context, that's uh, back to school. Those are back to school numbers, a time when everybody is going through uh, a transition of from one type of uh, life to another type of life, 200 tickets a day. When something does break, we have what's called the tech exchange. It's a three, three days a week, non-contact pickup and drop off service to exchange equipment that needs repair. So far, we've served about 80 students, staff and families in that tech exchange in week one. Number four, staff support. Our digital learning team has unique skills in helping staff use technology to support instruction. You might recall that we are in year three of providing entirely online courses at some at our secondary sites. So we have a depth of experience here to draw from. The digital learning team so far since in the preparation for distance learning has provided 20 professional development sessions for our staff and about which about 500 teachers having attended those PD sessions. Our team isn't just the people at ESC, but it includes the media and tech integration staff. It includes the um, tech pairs in buildings and the media clerks. Uh, all those people know our teachers best. Uh, that, those teachers and teams are also providing additional support and one-to-one -one support for our staff. And I'll, I'll just echo what a couple people have said here. I couldn't be prouder at the way people have stepped up through whatever their families are going through, through whatever they're going through uh, personally. Uh, we have not had problems getting people to come in, do their jobs, and go above and beyond to, to help our kids in Bloomington. So quite a proud moment for, for all of us, I think. Uh, that concludes my summary of the technology supports. I'll hand it back to you, Rick. Thank you, John. We're gonna move now into hearing from the school levels. We're gonna start at the high school level with Carol Camper, principal of Kennedy High School and language arts teacher at Jefferson High School, Cassie Pagel. Thank you, Rick. Um, board Chair Corman, Superintendent Fujitaki, board members, and the Bloomington community. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak tonight on behalf of the secondary schools, but most specifically, probably Kennedy High School. First and foremost, I just wanna reiterate what everybody else has said. I could not be more proud of our teachers, our staff, and our students. As soon as we learned that we were going to distance learning, our teachers immediately stepped up and engaged in looking at standards and looking at their lessons and beginning the process of converting them to uh, digital platforms, whether that be Google Classroom or Moodle or Canvas. Um, they immediately embraced that and, um, and just really worked together. Um, our department leads stepped up and really provided the guidance necessary and the leadership to make sure that everybody in their department had the um, the skill set, the tools that they needed to make this um, uh, distance learning really work for our students um, in a way that, as Andy spoke to, you know, we didn't plan for this. Our students didn't, you know, our students like coming to school. They like the connection. They like the affirmation that they get from teachers. They like peer connection. Um, and so this transition for them has been um, a challenge. And so our teachers have really stepped up to really meet students where they are at. So I really appreciate that. Our instructional teachers um, and coaches and technology have been outstanding. 
They've offered uh, mini PD on day one. They continue to offer PD throughout the week at Kennedy. Um, Kevin Nelson, our tech lead, offers every day an hour of kind of drop-in support that teachers can come in and ask questions. And so that's just been um, just awesome. I, could be not, I couldn't be more proud of them. Um, regarding our students, um, we've had 80% um, log in and engage in learning every day last week. Um, that's been amazing. Um, I'm super proud of them. The students that haven't logged in, logged in, we have a system of supports already set up. So uh, our counselors and our admin and our case managers and our advocates and our support pairs are calling and making connections and um, working to figure out why they're not engaged and, and solving problems and getting students on board. So that's been, um, that's been fantastic. Um, I just want to give a shout out to, to the district. Um, I really appreciate the, um, just a really response, the, the food service that's been provided, um, the updates on healthcare and just knowing what's, what's happening in the world. And I appreciate all that Hannah's done. I also um, just, just all the services. I just, people uh, giving the time up to, to drive vans, to deliver food. I just, I could not be more proud of just the, the um, just taking care of the whole child and the whole family. So thank you. I'm just super proud of our, our school and community. And um, I guess I'll pass it off to um, Cassie to kind of get from the teacher perspective. Okay, thank you, Carol. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm an English teacher from Jefferson High School. Um, so it's a little bit of a different perspective from Kennedy, but similar. Um, I know something that's been really helpful that we have is a distance learning site for our um, students and staff and parents to access throughout all of this. Um, in fact, we just got a couple of messages from students that said, uh, there's a little link that they can click that says, I need help. And then um, the administration, counselors, whoever sets them up with the help that they need. And one of our students actually just signed in and said, I don't really need help. I just want to say that I miss you. <laughs> so um, that's been going well. I actually even just got an email recently um, within the past few minutes from my principal asking us for ways to continue to build community and have fun, even though we're not in the building. So. We're trying to maintain those relationships um, even through this distance learning. Um, like uh, Kubis was saying, Mr. Kubis was saying, um, we are in a state of emergency school and I think that's been kind of tough to come to terms with as we were getting really excited about going into the last trimester. Um, so I think right now the teachers are just trying to find the balance of emergency school and getting to just those standards while still providing a, a an excellent Bloomington standard education. So we're just kind of dealing with all of that. Um, some things that I've been doing, I do teach an online class already, so I was pretty set with Canvas. Um, and I know a lot of teachers are doing, like myself, office hours daily. So my office hours are 9 to 11, where my students have a link and they can just drop in a Google Hangout just like this. And then I started with my freshmen having an optional synchronous meeting that a lot of my students have been showing up to um, on Mondays. So they pop in and um, I just go over the instructions for the week and go over the assignments from the past week, answer questions and you know just say hello to my students. But it's definitely a transition for all of us, um, especially my freshmen. <laughs> I know that uh, this is their a lot of their first experiences with online education. My seniors are doing a little bit better. Um, so I think that's just, that's where we're at right now is just trying to make this transition um, while still having these good relationships with our students and ensuring their success. Thank you, Carol and Cassie. Next up, we'll uh, hear from Brian Ingeman, the principal at Oak Grove Middle School, and Katrina Van Riven, an ESL teacher at Valley View Middle School, and also one of our uh, uh, finalists for the Minnesota Teacher of the Year, Brian and Katrina. Thank you, Rick. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, uh, school board members, Superintendent Fujitaki, of you and audience, and uh, thank you for letting us be on tonight to share the great work everyone's doing in the Bloomington Schools. I too am proud of the work we're all doing together. It's, it's great to see people come together and rally for a, a great cause of how we work together to support our Bloomington students. Uh, I can't say enough about the work of the teachers at our levels. Of course, all levels are doing a fantastic job and I know specifically the middle schools, uh, when the days are ready to prep for the distance learning, 
teachers were, were dialed and ready to go, had a lot of materials ready to go, a lot of creative collaboration together, and worked hard to make this a success so far. Um, all three middle schools really worked hard to help students make sure they get access to the hub each day. That's a key piece for driving our students to the hub to get their work, to take attendance. Uh, middle schools, we sent out easy to follow directions. We sent out a video tutorial trying to help parents and students along to be successful at this. And we're really stressing students to use the hub and make sure that every day they get there, take their attendance, find their homework, stay organized, and get their day started to be successful. And by the end of last week, we had a huge success uh, having close to 100% of all of our students logged into the hub at least once. Uh, we're increasing our daily participation rates. We're close to 90%, all three schools. And we're doing a great job of getting students to participate in online learning. Um, now our focus is getting more students to participate in the work daily and you know, helping teachers be successful with students on an individual basis along the way. But overall, our students have, are doing a great job responding to the to the challenge of being having distance learning be their new normal at school. And I can't thank our teachers enough for the work they do to make this engaging and, and fun for the students the best they can when we're not at school. I know teachers are using a variety of videos, Google Hangouts meets, and using their computers to call families along the way. And it could be teachers or counselors or uh, social workers, psychologists, support staff, special ed staff. Everyone's doing a great job of keeping our connections alive with students and making sure they feel supported during this difficult time. So at this time, I wanna pass it over to Katrina to talk more about the great work the teachers are doing at the middle level. Katrina, take it away. Thank you. Good evening, um, Chairman Corwoman, Superintendent Fujitaki, and members of the board. And thank you for giving me a few minutes to speak tonight. Um, these times are definitely really challenging. However, through challenge, oftentimes that leads to great growth. And I think that's where the middle school teachers are at in terms of hoping that through these challenging times, it will be a time of growth for our students and for our staff in terms of independence, perseverance, and connection. So um, first, in terms of uh, creativity, the teachers are really appreciative of all the tech tools and tech training that have been provided and the constant support of our technology department, our media center clerks, uh, teachers have been trying to use Edpuzzle, use Canvas, use other sites. Uh, at the middle school level, our students are particularly interested in collaboration. So we've been trying to, whether it be through Google Hangouts or other interactive sites, give them time to collaborate with each other. And they really enjoy seeing each other's faces uh, like we're doing now. Um, in addition, teachers at the middle school level have been doing a lot of collaboration with each other. So teams have still been meeting and having bi-weekly or sometimes even daily team meetings. People have been meeting with their subject areas. Uh, there's been meetings with counselors just to make sure that all the communication is consistent and is clear and that the students are being supported um, in a consistent way. And then also uh, the teachers at the middle school level have been working ha really hard to connect with students and families during this time, especially some of our students and families that are vulnerable and who otherwise this challenge could be overwhelming. So I know teachers have been using uh, phone calls to call families, including language bank to call families who don't speak English as a first language and may be struggling more with the technology than some of our uh, English speaking families. And they have also been uh, continuing to just communicate with each other and uh, make sure that the kids know and the families know that they matter during this time and that they're supported. So thank you to all the uh, district staff and everything they've done. The teachers are feeling supportive and we hope, hope supported and we hope that students are feeling supported as well. Great. Thank you very much, Brian and Katrina. We're here from the elementary level tonight. We are joined by Steve Abramson, a principal at Ridgeview Elementary School, and Maren Magsum, first grade teacher at Indian Mounds Elementary School. Thank you, Rick. Board Chair Corman, board members, Superintendent Fujitaki, and uh, families in Bloomington. Uh, welcome to this evening, and thank you for an opportunity to share uh, the kinds of things that, uh, as you've already heard are making a lot of us very proud. 
the hard work that's going into this experience is really changing a lot of lives. And uh, it's going to be a, a truly an experience that they will remember forever. Um, I'm gonna just quickly highlight four main things about the elementary distance learning, uh, the overview. You've heard about a lot of those because what's really interesting is the kinds of things that we're seeing our students doing in the high school and middle school, we're seeing that happen in the elementary school with students, with their devices as well. So first of all, all of our teachers, once again, have really jumped into the necessary planning, creating, and the PD that needs to take place to make these lessons, to make this distance learning happen. They do that as, as individuals, as teams, and they use all of the Google tools that uh, John Weiser's team has really provided them over time. Seesaw, Google Meet, um, FaceTime, uh, it's, it's really been a great team effort. Now our teachers, are really, our teachers are really communicating well and connecting with families. Uh, they're developing routines as, as, this, as the days go on. And I really wanna thank the teachers for their flexibility and the families for their flexibility as they're working out all the different little bumps in the road, the communication kinds of things. You know, it's different getting a kindergartner or a first grader connected online than a high school senior or even a middle schooler who it's like their, their life's blood is connecting with people. And uh, this really takes a family effort, particularly at the primary level. Um, as Andy mentioned earlier, that phase in um, that phase in timeline, that phase in routine that we're working through has really been an important uh, component as well. As we build in the depth and complexity in each of these lessons, and starting out last week with just literacy and math, and this week extending more, beginning slow is really, really helpful. And that helps the teachers monitor and adjust and kind of work with students and with families based on what the families are experiencing and the families are going through. And the last thing, real quickly, we couldn't be doing this without John Weiser, his department, our team of, of tech integrationists, our tech team, our media specialists, they are all really supporting our teachers in an amazing way to make the things happen that we see each and every day. And, and as an example of some of those things, I'm gonna pass it on to Marin Magson. Marin is a first grade teacher at Indian, Indian Mounds, and uh, she'll tell you a little bit about first grade. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Marin Magson, and I teach first grade. And during this online learning, it's been very interesting. You know, it came up pretty fast and, I remember a couple days before everything happened, people being like, I think we aren't coming back to school. And I was like, no way, there's no way this is not happening. But then it did. And I remember those first two days when we were at school by ourselves, like a lot of people were very panicked, but we've had a lot of really calm leadership and a lot of information. And it's been not overwhelming where they're constantly telling us a hundred different things, but I feel like it's been clear and they're helping everyone to know what to do. And for us, I think in the primary level, our first, our first goal was to get the kids their materials because especially in kindergarten, first and second, they were not used to taking home devices. So we were able to get devices to all of our families. And we also sent home materials with the kids as well. Things like notebooks, crayons, markers, pencils, pencil sharpeners, just so they would have the materials they're used to having at school. And once we were able to do that, we started trying to wrap our head around what we were going to do. We use the platform Seesaw. And Seesaw is an amazing tool that a lot of us in elementary schools um, have been using for many years. I've been using it for five years and it's just an amazing tool. It's so student friendly. It's very teacher friendly too, to create things that kids can upload videos, they can draw pictures, they can solve problems, they can voice record themselves reading books. There's just so many things they can do and so many things the teachers can do with it as well, whether it's they are voice recording their own lessons, whether they are making videos and attaching links. There's just so many things that we can do with it. So it's it's been a, a great tool that that's how all of our families are connecting with us every single day. And it's been very successful in my class. I've heard from a lot of parents and from the kids that 
they are loving their at home learning, but they still miss me. So that does make me feel good. And one thing that I know all of us in elementary school are really trying to do is just keep connecting with the kids and the families in creating videos for the kids or just adding voice comments so they keep connecting with us because that is such a big part of elementary school and we just think it's so important. So we are, you know, this challenge is something we never expected and we are all working together, collaborating, really relying on each other, on each other's different strengths and we will just keep moving forward and hoping for the best. Thank you. Thanks, Steve and Maren. Next up, we'll hear from the special education side. We've got Jennifer McIntyre this evening. Jennifer is the executive director of student services and Sarah Golke, special education teacher also at Indian Mounds Elementary School. Thank you, Rick. Um, thank you, Chairperson Corman, members of the board, uh, and Superintendent Fujitaki, and our viewing public. Thank you for this opportunity to be able to talk about the work that we've been doing within student services um, to align with the, the district um, overall distance learning plan and really being able to identify the needs of our students within special education and in particular students who are needing additional supports and services during this time. Um, I have to echo what my colleagues have said repetitively during this board uh, meeting. I'm unbelievably proud of the team that has come together, both the district level leadership team um, and the, the leadership that has come from that um, and, and come together. But I'm unbelievably proud of the work that our teachers are doing, our paraprofessionals are doing, all of our related service providers really coming together to figure out how to provide supports to students and to families in a very different way in a really quick period of time. Um, and they're doing it and it almost seems effortless, which I know and Sarah will talk about this, it is not. Um, it takes a lot of time and energy and um, those two weeks that we had and including spring break, many of them worked, um, many of them were collaborating. And I know within our Department of Special Education, many were already contacting families to figure out how do we provide services to our families and our students um, to be meaningful and to, and to really support them as we made this, this change. Uh, I want to highlight a couple of things and then I really want to give Sarah an opportunity to talk about what um, she has been doing in her classroom and working with the students and families in which she works. Um, it's been fun to, to get to hear more about what's been happening in her classroom. Um, the teams within special education services in particular um, have been coming together across all of our services. So we've been looking at how do we combine together what our classroom teachers and paraprofessionals are providing supports to our um, to our families, to their homes, and to our students. Um, but then how do we also bring in our speech clinicians, our occupational therapists, our physical therapists, our adaptive PE folks? Um, how do we bring them all in and not overwhelm families and students and really do it in a meaningful manner? And our teams have been collaborating very closely with one another and teaming on a regular basis to really work that out so that it's meaningful to families and students and, and just building that collaboration. Um, and, I, and any of the families who are watching that are receiving any of our services, thank you for your patience as we work through this. It's um, an interesting uh, journey to be on, uh, to say the least, and to, to work through this. And we could not, of course, do it without our technology partners and our general education partners who are coming right alongside us to figure out how do we make those necessary accommodations, modifications for students. So um, with that, I'm going to ask Sarah to talk a little bit about what she has been doing in her classroom. She's one of our, our classroom teachers who works specifically with students with autism, and she works at Indian Mounds Elementary School. So Sarah, go ahead. Yeah. Good, evening. Good evening, everyone. As Jennifer said, I am a SUN teacher at Indian Mounds Elementary, so I work with students with autism and cognitive disabilities, primarily students with limited verbal language and are learning expressive communication through assistive technology which I mean, this COVID-19 has been so hard for so many families and all educators and all families that I'm sure you're wondering how distance learning is looking with my classroom. It definitely took a lot of teaming and collaborating with my other Sun and Strive colleagues to kind of figure out what distance learning looks for this population. Um, we, um, last week I connected with families and helped them get connected with CESA, similar to like what Marin was saying. It's a very friendly um, format to connect with families and I connected on Google Meet. And so I just took last week to um, call and help get families set up, thanks to technology for any support we had in that and the wonderful PD to help me understand it better. And when I asked the 
parent what would be helpful for learning, they mentioned seeing familiar faces and teaching. And as soon as I could, I started setting up a live morning meeting for my students where I had my students attend. I asked all of my special ed paraprofessionals to attend. That way um, they could all participate in the meeting. I record my morning meeting. So some of my families that getting up and tuning in might be too hard. They can see the recording later in the day um, and see all of their teachers and paraprofessionals and have morning meeting is something that's very repetitive and routine and I do it the same way I did in the classroom. So for this hard change for my students, at least they see something familiar and just a small piece of predictability to make it comfortable. And I have gotten some of my students to attend and I do, I've had all my students engage in CESA in some way, whether it's watching the recording or I'm even surprised at some of the activities that they are completing because I know they need adult support to complete some of those activities in CESA. I have been collaborating with all of my related service providers, including DAPE, OT, and speech. And um, we have come up with a way to help service my students. Some of them will provide me videos of, a lot of them have created activity matrices, but they know for my students, um, that might be kind of difficult. So they have sent me video models that I can put in my lessons that I pushed out onto CESA to help um, show my students what they can do for adaptive FIAD. Or for speech, they um, are creating videos, for instance, how to um, cook and use or make bake, and they might use an assistive technology tool to help model language. And that's something I can also show my students. And they're also invited my, to attend my live morning meeting. Um, this week, I'm connecting with families again to see how is this format working to hear if this is something that is working and hoping that um, they can give me feedback to just like um, Andy Kubis said, like, am I doing too much? Am I doing too less? <laughs> if to help meet the needs of family. And that's what I feel like I'm doing most is trying to meet where my families are at. Thank you, Sarah. Um, thank you so much for sharing that and for taking the time tonight to be with us. The last piece I want to share before I pass it back to um, uh, to Director Kaufman is we have been pulling together our mental health supports, as you can imagine, going through this time of crisis um, for all of us, for our staff, our families, our students, um, for, for all of us involved, it really has been a lot to take on. And so we have brought together our teams of school counselors, school social workers, and school psychologists to really start to look at overall mental health supports and resources um, as a district. And particularly during a time of crisis when we know that there's um, illness and hospitalization and other um, considerations we need to be making as a district. So I wanted to make sure that I shared that as well because it, it's a a key component, I believe, of us moving forward is making sure we have some solid mental health resources in place. So with that, I will um, pass it back to Rick. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Sarah. Uh, next up, we'll get an update on the early childhood work. Jake Winchell uh, will come back, the executive, new executive director of community education, and also Galen Seraph, preschool teacher at the Pond Family Center. Good evening again, board, Chair Corman, Superintendent Fujitaki in the Bloomington community. Community education has been greatly affected by this pandemic, with many of our operations coming to a complete halt. Um, I'm very proud of what I've seen from our staff of how they've handled this with professionalism. Um, but one area that we've been able to maintain operations is in early childhood. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Gay Lynn, who is our early, early learning services preschool coordinator, who will talk to you more about that. Good evening, and thank you, Jake. Um, MDE is allowing distance learning for children and their families ages zero to five who are enrolled in ECFE, Early Childhood Family Education Programming, or preschool programming regardless of the funding source. Early Learning Services decided that this was the most equitable way to move forward. So Early Learning Services has been hard at work um, to design and implement a family-focused distance learning plan. Our partners in early childhood special education have been busy collaborating with our programming as well as with community and home-based programming for children who receive special education services. 
Early learning services and early childhood special education currently serve more than 1,000 children and their families ages zero to five. The teachers in early learning services have been using Seesaw, just like many in the district, to connect with families for the past couple of years. 95% of the children and families were already connected and families are comfortable with the platform. So this connection, I think, has helped to make the transition to distance learning easier for our families. Teachers are using other means like email and phone calls to connect with the families who are not on Seesaw for whatever reason. To prepare for distance learning, the Early Learning Services team created and assembled bags for each preschool child, which contained items um, to support their at-home learning. And these bags contained items such as crayons, scissors, a deck of cards or dice, pencils, whiteboards or papers, things like that. This way the teachers know too what items they can use to build their future lessons and activities from. The bags were picked up by families during the same window that the K-12 resources were being picked up. For the preschool families who could not pick up the bags, we, made, um, we mailed them to their homes. District distance learning looks a little bit different in early childhood. The goal for teachers is to connect with each family each day the child or family would be in programming. For some of our classes, like in um, ECFE class, they may only attend one day a week. Teachers are providing activities to do at home that in, in where you need minimal or everyday household items that are standards based. We're still basing all of our activities on our early childhood indicators of progress. Um, one of our activities that we have included would be making a pattern using silverware, fork, spoon, fork, spoon. Teachers are also making videos of themselves reading stories to children, singing songs, and that kind of thing. All of the activities can be done with any family member, an older sibling, a grandparent, or whoever is available. Our parent educators have been hard at work designing supports for families as they navigate this new challenge. We can directly connect any family in our program to a licensed parent educator and we can send home resources to support in an area that a parent is struggling with. We have a parent educator who can also provide these resources in Spanish. Early childhood screening is on hold at this time per MDE. The team is contacting all families and rescheduling appointments for later this year. When we know more, we'll reach out to those families who have appointments or who still need appointments. This first week of distance learning has seen high levels of engagement and connection between families and teachers. The children are so excited to see their teachers and hear their voices, and the teachers are also excited to connect with their students and families. Families felt, have felt that the activities are engaging and manageable, and they have expressed a lot of appreciation for maintaining that home school connection, which is so important. Families tell us they feel supported during this challenging time. The Early Learning Services staff really miss the students and families, and we can't wait to see them again in person. We're happy to be able to serve the children and families in this way during this challenging time. Thank you. One last comment for me is that these programs are mainly fee-based programs, and if you saw the governor's executive order, um, distance learning is only K through 12, so it does not include um, community education or early childhood. So uh, we cannot charge tuition during this time, and um, we're doing this with no income from those tuition-based programs. Back to you, Rick. Thank you, Jake. Thank you, Galen. Um, we're going to move now to some of the services that we've been providing uh, to students and families outside of the school. Uh, so the first one we're going to hear from Renetta Runford. Renetta is our food services manager and Kim Pollock. Kim is a paraprofessional at Washburn Elementary School, but uh, Kim has been assisting with uh, the grab and go meals at uh, Kennedy High School and actually uh, took the lead on the first day and the days following, did a great job of uh, getting us all ready for that. So I'm gonna turn it over to Renetta and Kim. Great, well, thank you. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to address the board regarding our grab and go meals. Um, I do wanna recognize definitely we have custodians that have pitched in to help we also have peer professionals. We had bus drivers. We had the OED staff, um, and not 
Now, last but not least, we had, of course, the food service staff that has stepped up to the plate for this as well. So um, we also had with our weather, um, I wrote a little piece here. It says, I wrote down, the sleet came and then it snowed. With wind and rain, Team Bloomington won't be slowed. And with that being said, last week we did um, 17, over 17,500 breakfast. We also did um, over 14,800 lunches. And with that also, we did over 8,000 um, 8, snacks. So we had, quite, uh, we had quite the lunches and breakfasts and snacks going out last week. Um, the meals are being delivered directly to Georgetown and also at other locations as well up our, as our two pickup locations. We um, at Westwood and then also at Washburn, we started that today. Um, again, I just wanna thank the wonderful committed staff that we have working together with us. We couldn't do this alone. Um, and as a team, and I'm very proud of everybody. And so the one thing I wanna say, the last thing is um, today when we went to uh, Kennedy High School, I don't know who the anonymous artists were, but they had decorated the, with, uh, the sidewalk with um, all sorts of fun um, thank yous for serving the meals. And so makes one very proud. So thank you. And I'm gonna turn it over um, to Kim. Thank you. Thanks, Renette. Um, good evening, Madam Chair Corman and members of the school board. Again, I'm Kim Pavic, and I had the pleasure of working with Rick um, that week starting right before spring break, and it's all learning process. So as we were kind of learning as we were going, and, you know, as Rick liked to say, okay, time to pivot. Um, so we kept trying to make everything work, um, and we eventually got down to a system where the cars would pull up, we would give them a number, put it under their windshield. So again, that way we wouldn't be coming in contact directly with any of the um, you know, persons in the car or whatnot. And um, then they would pull forward up to where the kitchen staff was bringing out the meals. And um, you know, they would call out, this car has four, kitchen staff would bring out four meals for that. Um, I just wanted to thank Rick and his team for all the organization. Um, I have never worked with such a collaborative group. Um, the paras that were there that day or that have been there have done such a great job with switching roles and being cooperative. And even in those sleeting rainy days, it was, you know what? We all just had smiles on our faces and, it was an enjoyable day, even though, because we got to see the kids and that's what was kind of the best part about it is putting that face to face with some of the families that we, um, you know, work with daily. Um, I did have the pleasure today of stopping by um, Westwood right at the end and all their hundred meals were already gone. So they were sending people over to um, either Kennedy or Valley View and so great things are happening. I also want to give um, a big shout out to Culver's and Caribou. They have also provided um, coffee and cookies and Culver's passed out gift cards um, for a free meal to some of the um, staff that had been working. Um, also Drooling Moose, I know that they've been delivering chocolate um, to some of the kitchen staff. And so I am just proud to be part of Bloomington. I live in Bloomington. I work in Bloomington. Um, I So I'm very proud to be a community member and also an employee. So with that, thank you. Thanks, Renetta. Thanks, uh, Kim. And uh, the power of that collaboration, it was uh, Kim understated it. They uh, they came up with ideas uh, to, to pivot, to make changes, to serve our families in a, in a more efficient manner. And um, yeah, I want to do a shout out to Rod Zivkovich and, and Tim Reebok, who's been uh, also helping out managing those two sites. And all of the paraprofessionals have, have been a lot of fun to work with um, over the last uh, several weeks. We're going to move now to child care with Julie Kinsella, the Youth and Family Program Manager, and Josh Stebbins, who is a paraprofessional and activities assistant at Washburn Elementary, who has been uh, helping at the child care at Poplar Bridge. 
Hi, thank you, Chair Corman, School Board, Superintendent Fujitaki, and the public viewing tonight. Um, the, it, again, as everybody has been saying, it takes a village to get all these things done. So we have had, we've worked with food service. We serve breakfast, lunch, and a snack during the day uh, for the kids. We have transportation to get the kids to Poplar Bridge for us if the parents need that. So they have been wonderful. Um, the nursing staff, as they've already mentioned, they have been so supportive and helping us out whenever we have questions, getting down on there if we're overwhelmed, taking the temperatures as the buses come in. Um, and then of course the paraprofessionals that have come in with such positive attitudes helping these kids as they're trying to figure this out and why we only have eight kids in a room and we have to keep this social distancing. They don't understand. They can't each be playing or throwing ball to each other. So we've come up with creative ways of getting soccer balls so they can kick it and things like that. Um, this week we're doing themed weeks for the theme days every day. Today was superhero days so the kids could come as superheroes and um, just trying to make it fun for the kids. We're also encouraging distance learning during the day. Um, technology has helped with that to get us um, those supplies in case kids don't come with the one-to-one -one devices or we have siblings that need those. Um, again, it's been running really smoothly, knock on wood so far. Everything's gone really well. Um, the kids come in, they're excited to come in. I again have to thank my youth and family coordinators and again the amazing paraprofessionals that have been coming in. And I'm going to pass it over to Josh, one of the amazing paraprofessionals, to tell you what's, how it's been going in the rooms. Thank you, and thank you, everybody. Um, this has been an interesting time for, I think, everyone involved. Um, the child care aspect of um, what we've been doing here with Bloomington, um, I think, started maybe a little rocky, uh, just in the sense of figuring out what worked, what didn't work, um, how we were going to connect um, with the kids. Um, uh, uh, personally, uh, I'm in a room with several students that I've never met before, which is fantastic. Um, getting to meet and create relationships with these students, um, but it also creates, um, it's just a, an opportunity to move past those initial, you know, I don't know you, um, I don't like what's going on around me. Um, children are extremely observant. And so being able to pick up on the anxiety and the stress and the uncertainty of what's going on around them um, leads to just a lot of those conversations about, yes, if you touch something, we have to wipe it down. And yes, if you want to play with someone, that's fine, but you need to have your distance. Um, I, I'm in one of the classrooms with some of the older students, so that's a little bit of an easier uh, sell, it's a little bit more understanding, um, where I know some of the younger students really want to share things and really want to share germs, and that's not great. Um, so doing a lot of conversations about that. Um, it's been really impressive and inspiring to see um, eras from all over Bloomington, from all over different um, backgrounds as far as elementary, middle, high school, um, SPED paras, kindergarten paras, whatever, what have you, coming together, working together, um, figuring out the best way to connect with these students and create a positive environment for them. Um, and the support and organizational leadership um, from Julie and from the other YFCs that are on site um, has been fantastic. Um, as a para, it's great to go into a building with uncertainty and feel supported and feel encouraged. Um, and so that's just been wonderful. Um, I, I'm excited for seeing where this continues, this difficult, um, but again, it's an opportunity um, for growth for uh, the students that we're serving and the families that we're serving. 
uh, so yeah, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Josh. And uh, also thanks to Dr. Jenna Mitzler, Jennifer McIntyre, and Hannah, who helped develop the initial child care plan, and, and to Julie and all of the paraprofessionals and staff. We're going to move now to uh, Kate Martin. Kate is our communications and marketing manager. I'm very proud of the work that uh, my team, Kate and Andrea George, have been doing to uh, meet the needs of communicating to our parents and staff. Kate. Hi, good evening, Chair Carmen, Superintendent Fujitaki, school board members and viewers. I'm here to give an overview of district communications related to COVID-19 pandemic situation. The community relations team, as Rick said, is responsible for, for providing timely, effective communications and updates to staff, families, students, and the community. At the onset of the situation, we developed a communications plan and we're following the plan, adjusting the information um, as the information changes. As many have stated, district staff and leaders, teachers and school staff have really pulled together as a team to plan and to adapt to quickly changing circumstances. This has helped us be responsive and get communications out efficiently, including translating parent communications into Spanish and Somali um, as needed. One of the first things we did was develop a dedicated web page on the district website for updated COVID-19 information. And we are posting all staff and parent communications there, as well as providing a variety of resources to support students and families during this time. We're in contact daily with the response team and the teams providing food services, childcare and distance learning to learn where the gaps might be in our communications. We're also monitoring our usual feedback channels fielding calls and emails, which help us have an idea of the questions people still have and responding and tailoring our communications that way. <clears throat> uh, we surveyed families and staff late last week to assess if we're meeting the needs uh, for communications and 86% responded positively. So thank you to those of you who responded. Thank you for your time and we appreciate you taking the time to provide the feedback. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Madam Chair, if I may share on behalf of all of our teammates, our community values are being tested at this time. It's hard not to feel the confusion, the anxiety, and the fear, but what we're also feeling is community. We must continue to be united and support each other. And as you can see tonight, we have reason to be extremely proud of all of our teammates, all of our leaders, and as a school family, we will continue to demonstrate compassion and care to our students our families and each other as we navigate this global health challenge. As I shared at the state of this city, we may never know if we overreacted or we did too much, but we will know if we underreacted or we did too little. So we wanna thank our students, our families, our employees and our community. We see you, we appreciate you, and we will get through this together. Chair Corman, um, that concludes our presentation for this evening, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kaufman. Um, and all board members have had an opportunity to ask questions previous to this meeting. And I will encourage you to continue to uh, communicate with administrators and staff members for other comments or questions that you might have. And I have some uh, closing remarks, but before I do that, I, I really wanna say thank you all for providing such detailed report that you brought to us today. Um, there is um, one word that kept, kept coming as you, as you spoke tonight, and that's the word proud. You kept saying proud and how proud you were of the, or you are of the, the work that different people, staff members have been doing. And I just want you to know that um, on behalf of the school board, we're very grateful to you. And we're also very proud of the work you have done. And we are proud of um, being able to serve in, in, in a school district, the Bloomington School District. And, and to be working alongside with you. And we're very grateful for all the work that every single one of you have done as well as your staff members. Um, I'm an educator myself, I'm a high school teacher and I know um, how different this time has been and how challenging it has been. And, and, and as a parent too, I have seen my kids, my, my Bloomington kids working here at home and 
And I can just say, you know, we have board members too who have kids at home and we have been able to witness the, the work, the amazing work that our teachers have been doing and as well of all, all the type of information that has been provided to us as, as parents and as board members too. Um, I also want to say thank you to the community, you know, the families for being patient. This is a very difficult time. Um, and of course, I want to say thank you to the community for the support given to the school district when the safety and technology referendum passed because it definitely had made a difference in, during this, this difficult time. Um, so I'll go to my, to my closing remarks now. Thank you. As a school board, we are extremely grateful for all the hard work that each and every employee has done during the past weeks. We are grateful for your hard work, your dedication, your efforts and sacrifices, and your flexibility to ensure that our students continue to receive the academic support services needed during this challenging time. Whether working from home, preparing for and launching distance learning, or on a school site providing other services and support, we all face the challenge of adapting to this new system while also taking care of our families and our health. There is no doubt this current situation is showing our nation how crucial public education is to our society. We are very fortunate to have excellent, bright, and committed professionals. People we know and trust will continue to help our students and families navigate all the changes and challenges with the same professionalism and compassion as always. Bloomington is a strong because you are strong. In these difficult times, we are called to remain strong and united and to work as a team. We know you're working hard and because we also value your well-being, we ask you to continue to support and care for one another. So please continue to take care of yourselves as well. And just know that we are thinking of you, of each one of you, every single day during this, this time, this, this difficult time and process that we're facing right now in our country, in our world. All right, so with that, I will go into our next item. And our last item in the agenda tonight is the financial update provided by Rad Sitkovich, the Executive Director of Finance and Support Services. Chair Gorman, um, the purpose of this uh, presentation is to give the board an update of the impact of uh, Governor Wall's executive order on the uh, board's approved budget uh, of both general fund food service and the fee-based educational programs, uh, community ed programs. One thing I'll say up front, as you've heard most of the night about uh, things are changing, whether it be how we're supposed to wear masks, not wear masks, um, how we're supposed to protect ourselves. The finance uh, pieces of this puzzle are, are in similar ways of us trying to understand the overall of what this, the state is providing for us, what the federal government's providing for us and how we're, we, we uh, navigate through that uh, sea of information. Um, a lot of research is being done by the superintendent, uh, the executive director of HR, legal counsel, uh, cabinet members, directors of departments to try to figure out what um, what actually all the different pieces mean. And so as I go through kind of giving you a high level, uh, I provided you an outline of that in uh, um, your board packet, but just kind of giving you the high level of the three programs where we think at this point in time uh, they're at and some of the things that we're looking at from both a, a state and federal level of uh, possibly having uh, benefiting us and then also two of some actions that we are planning on taking uh, with the uh, mainly the community education department uh, right now. So um, if we look at the general fund itself, the major fund, most of the revenue that's provided by the general fund, the governor and the state have committed to still providing those funds. So based on that, uh, we don't see any real significant change within there. We see some savings um, over time. Um, right now, we're not hiring subs for the classroom or for, for paras. Um, so we're seeing some savings there, but we also have additional increases in costs for personal protection equipment. 
uh, masks, uh, gloves, uh, sanitizers, all those different pieces. Um, we also have additional costs. You heard from uh, Executive Director Kubis about uh, sending out mailings and the rest. It's additional mailings that we had to do, additional copies that we had to make. And then uh, through other, the costs associated with the child care program. So all those costs uh, and the, the revenues there, we feel that at this point in time, um, our analysis of the general fund is the general fund is in uh, fine shape to what the budget the board approved uh, back in uh, December, the revised budget. As we move on to food service, uh, with the food service area, the governor requires the school district to provide uh, grab and go meals. And based on that, um, we've we've tried to see what what the interpreted is and what we've been trying to do is keep staff on uh, working staff to be able to provide as uh, many meals as possible uh, some of the the challenges are um, with the revenue impact is uh, we're not being able to serve as many meals as we'd serve in a day day process also with that is we're not able to uh, charge a fee for those meals and we're, we don't have the a la carte uh, type of, of programming within our meals. So um, we're seeing a reduction in revenue in that regard. On the expenditure end, um, as we keep looking at um, different ways of trying to balance things, um, the issue comes is based on our understanding, at least at this point, is that we are uh, using the same staffing that we've paid all year long um, some of those um, employees have some underlying conditions as we, we go through the process. So they're not able to come in and, and work. Um, the, what uh, Renetta shared with you is the, the meals that we're doing, there's more labor intensity because we're in prepping and packaging because we have to package each meal. It's not being just put it on a, a tray um, and then you have breaks in between of different lunch periods. Um, and also we, we continue to look at how we can do things more efficiently uh, in labor costs to be able to, to do things. Um, in the way of product costs, we don't really see any real savings in product costs because uh, there's higher waste because we were unknown of how many accounts we're gonna have today. An example, we had a huge day on last Friday, our biggest day ever, uh, it was back down to uh, kind of Tuesday of last week today. So we never know those type of things. So we try to to um, do our best to uh, reuse the, the meals we can, uh, but we have to always watch that. And then, as I mentioned before, it's buying the packaging for all these different meals of making sure that uh, they're packaged. Um, so it's, it's unknown at this point in time if the, the state or the federal government will provide additional relief uh, for this mandate. Uh, we keep researching it um, and uh, we will up keep updating the board as time goes on uh, to uh, any new information regarding that. I think our, our main uh, focus right now is to provide uh, the community um, healthy meals um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so uh, that's our, our goal and we're working toward it to do it the most efficient way possible. Uh, the next area, as uh, Jake mentioned earlier about community education, the fee-based uh, programs, the challenge in those programs is because uh, most of them are uh, 95 to 100% fee-based um, programs such as aquatics, um, enrichment, building reservations, the activity centers, Kit Safari, and Early Learners Academy. So in looking at those um, different programs, um, this, there's the revenue impact is uh, because they're fee-based, uh, we're not seeing any revenue coming in uh, since March 16th. Uh, also, we're, we're having to refund tuition or unused days of programming uh, that needs to go back to, uh, to parents and the community members that Jake and his team are working on at this point in time. Um, the, the expenditure, uh, as we kind of looked at, as I mentioned earlier, not understanding, um, how, um, 
this, the legislature and the governor wanted us to handle uh, community ed and other fee-based programs, um, we were going off of the initial governor's order of compliance that uh, we don't furlough anybody, we keep everybody on, and we move forward in that regard. Um, as we learned uh, last Thursday, uh, new guidance from MDE uh, stated that that uh, was not the case. Um, and uh, based on that new guidance, there's a plan to furlough uh, hourly employees within these programs. Uh, also based on new guidance that we received uh, this last week, is does not look like either the state or federal government has any intention of uh, providing extra funding for these type of programs to uh, make them whole. So uh, kind of the update with those three programs, um, I think uh, Director uh, Bennett also had a question about uh, the impact of, of the staff in these programs. Um, it, right now, it looks like about 186 people are affected um, and the plan would be to, the furloughing would be at the end of the day on Tuesday. Uh, back to you, Director. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, any questions or comments from board members to Mr. Sitkovic? Uh, let's start with Director Bennett. Uh, no questions. Director Olson? No questions. Director Sorum? Director Sorum? Director Stark? Um, I do have just a clarifying question. So um, the, when we're talking about furloughing, we're talking about only the folks that are from fee-based programs because we heard from like ECFE programming is still going on even though it's fee-based. So can um, Mr. Zikovich maybe clarify which staff we're talking about? Um. Yes, I, as I mentioned, it's the programs of aquatics, enrichment, building reservations, activity center, kids safari, and early learners academy. The other programs do have funding sources of both the state and uh, uh, local property taxes that fund those programs. Yes, they have a fee part of them, but it's a it's a minor part of their funding source. Thank you. Okay, Director Steiger. No questions. Director Sorm has no questions. Director Bibi? Um, I'm just wondering, um, since we just found out this information, um, will the, those particular work workers be notified tomorrow or have they already been notified? My understanding that the um, supervisors within those programs have been notifying the people starting today. Okay, thank you. Okay, no other questions. Um, thank you, Mr. Sitkovich. Thank you, Chair Corman. Okay. Now we have come to the end of our meeting. Um, Superintendent Fujitaki, do you have any additional comments? No, I have no additional comments, thank you. Okay. Well, I'd like to once again, thanks everyone. And um, thank you for such detailed reports and for being here with us tonight and also for the, the listening and viewing audience. And thank you to uh, BECTV too for broadcasting of this meeting tonight and for all your help. And to every single um, staff member for Bloomington Schools, thanks a lot. Um, I'd like to um, ask someone to move adjournment of the meeting tonight. A motion to adjourn. Okay, any seconds? Second. Sorry. Thank you. All those in favor of adjourning the meeting, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No one opposing. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Have a good night and take good care of yourself. Thank you.